health-related information on the following show provides general information only. Content presented on any show by any host or guest should not be substituted for a doctor's advice. Always consult your physician before beginning any new diet, exercise, or treatment program. Welcome to Accelerated Health TV and Radio Show. I'm your host, Sarah Banta. I'm a health coach, natural supplement expert, and a busy mom of three. Make sure you hit the subscribe button below so you're notified every week with my new podcasts on Mondays and Tuesdays. And if you haven't already, join my free group coaching with the Telegram link below. I teach you on a daily basis with tips and tools to enhance your health. And you are going to be a part of a like-minded group to support you on your journey in addition to truly taking control of your health. My goal is to reach everyone on earth with eyes to see and ears to hear my message of healing. So please help me with that goal. Share this podcast with a few of your friends who may need my help. And with this one, everyone's going to need to hear it. We have such a special guest on today. Karan Krishnan is a research microbiologist and has been involved in the dietary supplement and and nutrition market for the past 17 years. He comes from a strict research background, having spent several years with hands-on R&D in the fields of molecular medicine and microbiology, and he left the university to research and to take a a position at the U.S. Business Development and Product Development Lead for a monoenzyme in in USA in the United States. So welcome, Karan. How are you today? I'm doing great, Sarah. How are you? I'm fantastic, and thanks to a lot of your supplements that I take on a daily basis to keep me going. Um, and today we are talking about unraveling the gut health and the anxiety and depression connection. And a little story about me is that my health rock bottom was all about the gut. And I went to a GI doctor. They put tubes down me, around me, and up me. And literally, the doctor said, well, you you have IBS, take some Metamucil, and goodbye. Mm-hmm. And that was my um, start in being frustrated with Western medicine and knowing that there were better answers out there. And fast forward to um, living in a world where I have three kids and all of their friends and have anxiety or depression. They're on ADHD drugs. They're they're, I I actually don't know any children that are not on some sort of medication that is related to the brain, but you and I know is connected to the gut. And so that's why this, this topic is so um, close to my heart. And I believe in everything you do. And I love everything you're about and where you're coming from and just wanting to help people heal themselves. So with all of that said, why don't you just give a little bit of a background of why you got into what you're doing now and your passion behind this? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here actually today. My one of my biggest passions is educating people and empowering them. So getting to do programs like this where we get to share information that will empower somebody is really uh, amazing. So, um, you know, I, I'm not a person of many talents, but I have one. Um, and that one talent that I discovered I have is understanding complex ideas, science in particular, and then being able to translate that to people in a way that they understand it. Right. So that led me to always studying science, whether it's in chemistry, biology, physics, mathematics. I always uh, indulged in all of those topics. Um, I finally picked microbiology as the area to go into because I thought it, it serviced my deepest curiosities because it's a, a kind of an unseen universe uh, that impacts everything. But we're we're barely scratching the surface on understanding it, right? And so it it was very much to me like the biological equivalent of quantum mechanics or, you know, astrophysics, which are other areas that are, that truly fascinate me, but the biology part was, was much more soothing. Um, And so I went in, I went into that field and, and, and I, of course, 
get to drive uh, and utilize my passion for science and, and innovation and discovery because we're learning new things almost every single day. And there's new opportunities to affect people's health when you're working in the world of the microbiome and, and you know, molecular level of medicine. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's an absolute um, exciting place to be. And, um, and then, you know, throughout college, I, I did many jobs. I worked in labs. I did all kinds of things. But one of the jobs that I really enjoyed, uh, which I felt I did really well at, is as a tutor. So I was a, I was a science tutor for athletes and for nursing students and even medical students at some point. Um, and, and I would tutor them in microbiology or biochemistry. And what I was always told is like, wow, you made that so understandable. Why can't the professor teach it like this? You know, and, and that's when I realized so I have a knack of being able to understand this kind of complex information, kind of see the story and then be able to convey that to people in a way that makes sense to them. So that was important to me in part of my whole professional career of jumping into the world of microbiology, trying to make headway in understanding the microbiome in a way that we can help people with it, but then also playing a significant role in teaching and lecturing and spending countless hours doing interviews and programs like this with the goal of putting out enough understandable content so people are empowered, right? At the end of the day, we can't lean on our doctors. We can't just lean on our white coat professionals for our health. We have to advocate for ourselves. We have to advocate for our, for our family members and for our friends and so on. And so the more knowledge we have, the more understanding we have of things, the easier it becomes. Um, and that is, you know, kind of a life's passion for me. No matter what I'm doing, I'm always forever going to be teaching and explaining things to people, things that I understand. And you do a fantastic job. So kudos to you. And it, it really takes um, someone special who understands the geeky science uh, and can put the lab coat on and do the work in the lab and all of the studies and then actually have the bedside manner and to be able to communicate the way you do. So um, you definitely have a gift. And you know, you think about the gut and there's a lot of people out there and I've got family members myself who say, well, I don't have gut issues. Um, I'm not bloated. I don't have um, constipation. I don't have diarrhea. I'm totally fine. But you see it in their brain activity or their ADHD or manifesting in some other issues. And that's why this episode is for everybody out there. I heard you say a statistic in one study that you tested some, I believe, 20 year olds, healthy, um, um, not children, young adults mm -hmm. that had no symptoms, but over 50% of them had leaky gut and didn't even know it was am I saying that correctly? You are. Yeah, that was one of our first leaky gut studies. So the, the average age of that cohort of people was about 22, uh, prime of their life, right? In every other way you would think of their normal body weight, no diagnosed conditions, not on any chronic, on medications for any chronic diseases. Um, they're absolutely fine and, and from, from the way, from looking at them from the outside. Uh, but 55% of them had very severe leaky gut to the point where it actually takes their body almost two weeks to recover from the inflammation from a single meal, right? Mm -hmm. That's how severe it is. And you can measure that inflammation over time. And in the study that we ended up publishing, we show that inflammation after we feed them a meal. Now, to, to induce it and make it more dramatic, we fed them a, not a very healthy meal. You know, we fed them a frozen pizza or fast food uh, hamburger. But that's what these people are eating. Right. You know, they're not, they're mostly college students. It's not like they're, you know, gardening and, and picking fresh organic fruit and eating that all day long, right? This is the stuff they're eating. And, and, and even if you're eating good stuff, when your gut is that dysbiotic and leaky, you're going to get significant inflammation. So, and, and that was really telling to me because there was a study that was published in 2015 in the journals of Frontiers of Immunology. It was a meta-analysis paper, which means that it's a study of all kinds of studies on the topic, right? So a group of researchers will go through and comb through all the studies on the topic. They will, they will collate all the relevant ones that fit the right model and have the right data sets and so on. And they basically concluded 
that based on all the research available now, or up to at that point, this was back in 2015, that intestinal permeability and the resulting uh, chronic low-grade inflammation, a lot of it induced by stress, right? And this is something that they focused on, was the number one cause of morbidity and mortality worldwide. Mm -hmm. That's the number one killer of people, right? Stress, chronic leaky gut, chronic low-grade inflammation. That sets you up for all other manners of disease. And so what you were saying earlier of people feeling like I don't have a digest, I don't have a gut issue because I don't bloat, I don't have diarrhea, I don't have constipation. You know, that's just one small dimension. If you're if you're having all those symptoms, then not only do you absolutely have a gut issue, but you've probably had one for way longer than those symptoms have shown up and other things are starting to get dismantled in your body. You know, if you don't have those gut symptoms, if you've had any skin issues like acne, eczema, rosacea, right, uh, psoriasis, you have a gut issue. If you have anxiety, sleep issues, if you have depression, you have a gut issue. If you have brain fog, um, you know, if you if you have low energy, um, it, any of those things, you have a gut issue, right? The gut, uh, if you have metabolic syndrome, if you're overweight, you struggle with weight or you're underweight, you can't put on weight, you know, all of these things are a gut issue. And the gut is a central command center. And if your gut is dysbiotic, it'll manifest in many different ways. So let's describe what leaky gut is, because I throw the word around a lot and I always talk about it all starts in your gut, whether it's weight gain or your heart issues or your anxiety or depression, just like you're talking about all of these chronic issues start in the gut. And something I want to make sure we emphasize is what you said about it being just one meal. So you can say, well, I just had one cheat meal this week. Well, that one cheat meal, you know, the calories in are in, are in and out, but the ramifications that are left behind for when you actually eat your healthy meal, um, there's a cascade of issues and it's, it's unfortunate. And we're just the messengers. Don't shoot us. Mm -hmm. It is. It's not that fair. Yes, I agree. It's not fair. You can't go out and have Ben and Jerry's and a pizza and be fine uh, the next day. But um, so let's get into what is leaky gut and why can't we get away with those cheat meals just once in a while and how it affects the rest of our our daily intake. Right. And and I'll add to that that um, you know. If your gut is leaky, you absolutely cannot get away with it, right? If you've built resilience, your gut is not leaky, then you likely can get away with it from time to time. And that's really the goal, it, to me, at least from a health perspective, is building resilience because you're never going to make 100% the right choices, nor will you will all those choices be within your control all the time. So you want resilience within your system. So should you encounter something like a new virus or should you be in a place where you can't eat anything but something that's not healthy for you you're able to do those things and be okay but that's if you build resilience right the people with leaky gut that one meal is going to cost them two weeks of inflammation but then at the same time and by the end of that study the treatment group had such built built such resilience and stopped leakiness in the gut we gave them the same gas station pizza horrific meal and they had no endotoxemia no inflammation no leaky gut from it right so so you can build resilience um and that's that's a really important component of this so let's talk about what leaky gut actually is um keep in mind that your intestines your gut as as we call it have to be leaky to a certain degree right they have to be selectively permeable because you have to let a lot of things through the vast majority of nutrients and everything that we get into our system goes through our digestive tract from things we eat, we drink, we swallow inadvertently through uh, breathing it in and then it being driven back to, into your digestive tract or things that enter your eyes or your ears, everything uh, uh, you know drips into your throat eventually and you swallow it. And so most things your body encounters are going to go through the digestive tract at some point. And there are things that your body has to let through, like nutrients, for example, um, you know, all the vitamins, minerals, fats, proteins, carbohydrates, amino acids in the case of proteins, those have to get through. 
but you don't want toxins and, you know, uh, antigens and viruses and all of those things getting through either. And so your gut has to become selectively permeable. And there is a couple of structures in place to allow for that selective permeability. But as it turns out, those structures and how they function are largely dictated and controlled by the microbes that are present there. So if the wrong microbes are, are present, then that whole structure doesn't function and your gut becomes incredibly permeable, not selectively permeable, right? So let's talk about the structure for a moment. Um, if you look at your small intestine, where a lot of absorption and all that happens, you've got this mucosal layer, and then you've got all these microvilli, right? All these finger-like projections. You, you've got all these villi and my, microvilli on top of it. And the whole point of that is to add lots of surface area to the small intestine. So you have a lot of surface area for absorption of nutrients and food. Because as the food moves through the small intestine, it takes time to break down and digest the macromolecules into the micromolecules that you can then absorb. So in, in order for you to absorb things properly, you need time and you need surface area. Right. So this is why emptying of the of the small intestine is slowed down. Things jump out of your stomach relatively quick. Once you eat, it goes in the stomach, gets mashed up. Hydrochloric acid is added and then it's dumped into the small intestine. And then it sits in the small intestine for a few hours before it can move on to the large. And that time is needed and the surface area is needed. Right. So you've got this villi, microvilli, and then you've got this mucosal layer sitting on top of it. Now, the villi, the, the lining of the villi is made up of your intestinal epithelium. This is a single cell thick layer of cells kind of sitting shoulder to shoulder, right? And if you think about it, this is the biggest barrier in your body. And it's the final step of something actually being inside the body, right? When you swallow something, it's still outside of the body, technically, because your digestive tract is a tube that's open on both ends, right? So it can pass right through means it never actually entered your body. For it to go inside your body officially, it has to go through that mucosal layer, pass that intestinal epithelium, the single cells, and then enter into circulation. Now the circulation that's at the bottom of that is called the basolateral circulation. Most of what enters there, about 85%, goes first to the liver, and about 15% ends up in general circulation, right? But the things that go to the liver is so that the liver can decide what to do with it, metabolize it, you know, conjugate it, neutralize it, so you don't, it doesn't become problematic for you and so on. So you've got this lining that has the mucosa, that has all the microvilli, the microvilli aligned with single cells. The cells sit, sit shoulder to shoulder because when nutrients come through, some nutrients can pass through the cell. Right? That's called a transcellular pathway. The cells are designed to have an osmolarity gradient. So things like magnesium and calcium and things that have a charge to it can easily just pass right through the cell, end up at the bottom in circulation, right? No specific carriers or anything needed. These are important things. We need them all the time. So bring them in and let them pass right through. Then in between the cells, there's a space and that's called a paracellular pathway. That's for bigger things like amino acids like proteins or, or glucose molecules and so on, and or nutrients, right, that have to pass through. So the cells have to be able to open up and stay open for things to go through and then cinch up and close when we don't want things to go through, right? Now, the control mechanism of opening and closing this is done by this lattice of proteins um, in this tight junction. These are called Claudin and Occludin proteins. What they're called is not important, but just know that there's this lacing of proteins in between these cells. The proteins can loosen up to open the cells. Things will go through, and then the proteins tighten up like laces and close the cell back up, right? So that keeps the intestine from getting permeable. Also keep in mind that mucosa layer up top slows things down when they're moving through. You swallow something, you start digesting food up here above the mucosa layer. You've got big chunks of carbohydrates and proteins your enzymes go in and they break it all up right into smaller glucose monomers or fructose or amino acids or vitamins. And then all that stuff is sitting up here and it all is going to flow through into the lining. But the mucosal layer slows things down so it doesn't flood the system. Right. So things then slowly move through the mucosa, which is a, like a jelly like structure. And in the mucosa, this is where something very, very important happens. 
your immune system is monitoring what's coming through that mucosa. And this is where your immune system decides, is this a bad thing or a good thing, right? Are we going to attack this thing coming through or are we going to tolerate it? Now, the immune system doesn't actually know what's bad and good. The immune system is relying on the microbiome sitting in the mucosa to translate for it what is bad and what is good. So the microbes are trying to tell the immune system, hey, this is coming in. This is protein. It's totally fine. You don't need to attack it, right? Or this is a microbe. We've seen this microbe a million times. It's not really an issue. You don't have to attack it. Or holy cow, here's a virus. You need to pay attention to this. Go ahead and attack, attack this. So it's that crosstalk between the microbiome and the immune system that's constantly happening in that mucosa. And that's where a lot of the decisions are made for how your body is going to respond to things, right? So your, your tight junctions have to be sealed. They have to open at the right signals to let molecules through. And then certain things can pass through the cells. And then the mucosal structure has to have good integrity. You have to have good microbes in there speaking to the immune system, training the immune system what it should pay attention to and what it shouldn't pay attention to. If all of those things I just said are working properly, you won't have any issues. Right. You can eat almost anything you want. Right. You 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 will have few immunological issues. You'll have very, very little inflammation. You'll have resilience. Your gut will be strong. You'll have perfect bowel movements. Your immune system will be working in tip top condition and so on. Now, the problem is in the vast majority of people, certainly the 55 percent of those 20 something year olds that we tested, many of those things are dismantled. Right. And the dismantling starts with having dysfunctional bacteria in that mucosa layer, right? So what starts to happen if you have dysfunctional bacteria in that mucosa layer? There's two main things. One is you, you don't have the microbes that elicit the gene responses that maintain the tight junction proteins, right? So you start getting too, much, uh, too many areas of your gut lining where the tight junction proteins dismantle and then the cells stay open all the time. Right. So now that part is leaky. You also will get a, a situation where you have too many pathogen like uh, microbes in this mucosa layer that themselves are eliciting an immunological response. So this constant inflammation in that mucosa layer and that inflammation in the mucosa layer will also eventually start damaging the intestinal epithelial cells. Mm -hmm. So not only will you have cells that are open, you'll also all of a sudden missing cells. Because when the cell gets damaged through inflammation, it gets kicked out of the line of soldier cells sitting shoulder to shoulder. And now you've got cells sitting like this and then a gap where one got kicked out and it's not being replaced effectively, right? So now you have a full gap there in your gut. You've got tight junctions that are open. You have actual gaps in the gut. And then the other problem that occurs is the microbes that are dysfunctional, that are driving inflammation in the mucosal lining, that are not speaking to the immune system to try to help the immune system decide what to attack and what not to attack, those microbes are also not helping maintain the mucosal structure because the integrity of the mucosa is also dependent on good beneficial microbes, right? And we could specify what kind of microbes if, if that's important, but just know that a healthy microbiome is what maintains that healthy mucosa. So now this mucosa layer gets thinner and thinner and thinner over time. So the ability to slow down the influx of things penetrating through gets diminished. So then every time you eat things rush through, it's like a flood, a tsunami, if you will, of things, right? It could be nutrients, it could be microbes, it could be anything. And then your tight junctions are open, you have big gaps in it. So those things are all leaking through. And at the same time, because your, your microbes in that thin layer of mucosa aren't communicating well with your immune system, your immune system goes into panic mode because it thinks you're going to get trillions of microbes moving through. So everything that comes through that region gets an inflammatory immune response. Mm -hmm. There's no communication of, hey, tolerate this, don't tolerate that. Everything gets a, an immune response. So what you start to feel is intolerances, right? Things you used to be able to eat. You know, you used to be able to eat dairy to a certain degree and be fine. Now dairy creates massive GI issues for you now because your immune system's attacking the dairy protein because you don't have the microbes there to tell the immune system not to do that, 
right? So now you've got a, a very inflammatory, hyperactive immune response in the gut lining. You've got microbes that are dysfunctional, that are not repairing the mucosal layer, that are not repairing the tight junctions, that are not inducing the repair of damaged intestinal epithelium that are leaving gaps in the system. And many of those microbes themselves will produce toxins that drive this inflammatory process. Now you can't properly absorb nutrients. Your immune system can't discern good from bad. You've got all kinds of things leaking through into circulation. A lot of it, 85% of it that goes into that basal lateral circulation, remember, goes to the liver first, right? So now the liver is dealing with an unusually large amount of toxins that are coming through. The liver gets damaged. This is why you start to get fatty liver disease. Right? That's why many gut issues are also associated with a very high prevalence of fatty liver disease. Right, So we take SIBO, for example. Right, Something like 48-50% of SIBO patients have liver dysfunction. Right, Compare that to non-SIBO individuals of the same age, it's like 7%. Right, So you're almost 7-8 times likely to have liver dysfunction if you have SIBO because that dismantling of the gut structure goes hand in hand with overwhelming the liver. And if you overwhelm the liver, your bile acid pool that the liver is producing for you gets reduced. So you're not producing enough bile through the di- to, through use during digestion. So now you can't absorb fat soluble nutrients like vitamin D, vitamin K, vitamin E, and all that. So you become nutrient deficient, and you can't you can't actually control microbial growth in the lining of the gut because the bile acts as an antimicrobial. And part of its job is in the small intestine to maintain a low level of bacteria. So now you get an overgrowth of bacteria happening in the small intestine. All a lot of those bacteria are dysfunctional, uh, you know, because that's what started the process. And a lot of those are producing toxins that are leaking through in a profound way and creating chronic low grade inflammation in the individual. Right. So your digestive health system, your digestive health is not working right. Your immune system is going haywire because it has no communication. So it's just attacking everything. And and what the gut immune system does, it translates to the rest of the body's immune system. So now your immune system in your mucosa and your respiratory mucosa or in your vaginal mucosa or your skin mucosa are attacking everything it comes in contact with. So now all of a sudden you're you're, you're developing chronic sinusitis or allergies or chronic BV or chronic yeast infections or eczema or psoriasis on the skin. These are all inflammatory conditions being driven by a dysfunctional immune system that starts in the gut, right? And then you also have chronic low-grade inflammation throughout the body. And chronic low-grade inflammation is the number one driver of chronic disease. That is what sets up virtually every chronic disease there is. This is why that study concluded that that chronic low-grade inflammation as a result of a leaky gut was the number one driver of morbidity and mortality worldwide. It's the number one cause of disease and death worldwide, right? So that is how the whole system starts to get dismantled. When your gut is leaky now, your brain becomes very susceptible to a significant toxigenic attack that then sets you up with anxiety, depression, or in young kids, behavioral disorders, spectrum disorders, that eventually leads to Alzheimer's, you know, dementia and so on. Oh my gosh, I have so many questions in so little time. So where do we start? That makes sense, though, that, that, that explanation. That was amazing. Okay, so first, with the leaky gut, because I want to make sure I've got a lot of people wanting to know, okay, you're, this is all great information, but what do I do about it and what supplements? So with the leaky gut um, bundle supplements that you can all find it um, on sarabantahealth.com, there's the Mega Pre, Mega Mucosa, and the Mega Spore. How do these three supplements help guard your, your gut and heal that leaky gut? Yeah. Um, and this is what we, we worked on this for 10 years to really figure out what is the steps that occur that lead to a leaky gut. And then how do we reverse those steps? Right. So it's that's just that plain and simple. Um, the first thing that occurs anytime your gut becomes leaky is dysbiosis. That is the shifting of organisms where you're going away from all these important keystone species that protect the structures, that protect the tight junctions, that protect the mucosa 
to a predominance of organisms that don't, that eat away at the mucosa that produce toxins, right? So the first thing that you have to do is shift the microbiome. So then the question is, how do you shift the microbiome back towards these important keystone species? That's where the spores come in. One of the, one of the discoveries that we made was not only that spores um, can compete against dysfunctional bacteria. They've been known for that since 1950s, because there's a drug in the market that was launched in 1952 called, uh, from Sanofi Aventis uh, called Entrogermina. It's a bacillus endospore probiotic that's used to treat dysentery and gut infections, right? That drug, it's a probiotic drug that's been on the market since 1952, and they still use it today for traveler's diarrhea and other infections of the gut because it's known that bacillus does a great job of seeking out, identifying, and bringing down the growth of dysfunctional bacteria. But what we hypothesize is not only does it do that, it probably increases the growth of the beneficial bacteria. And so we published at least two papers showing that, is that when you add the bacillus, not only does it bring down those dysfunctional pathogens, but it dramatically increases the growth of the beneficial bacteria, what we call keystone species, that go to work rebuilding all of those structures, right? They rebuild the mucosa by producing things like short chain fatty acids, uh, by eliciting uh, gene expression of things like the muc T gene that causes your goblet cells to produce more mucus. They increase the expression of the tight junction proteins so you can rewire these cells to pull them back together. They increase the expression of an interleukin that when there's a gap from a damaged uh, intestinal epithelial cell that's been kicked out, it replaces that with a new healthy cell, right? So, it, so these microbes reform the structures. So the first step in fixing leaky gut is fixing the dysbiosis. That's the megaspore. The second step is- Real, real quick, Karan, can you um, just specify spore versus probiotic? Because I don't think a lot of people understand that you, what you're talking about is not just the typical probiotic you go to the market for. Yeah, and, and the thing is the vast majority of probiotics on the market don't qualify as probiotics per the supplement definition, right? So, or per the scientific definition. So the the- accepted World Health Organization definition of a probiotic is a live microorganism when administered in adequate amounts confers a health benefit to the host. So the very important part of that first part of the definition is that it has to be live. It has to function alive in the GI tract, right? So which means it has to survive through the gastric system and make it to the intestinal tract alive. And it has to have a metabolic function in the gut to improve the health of the host, and that has to be measured. The vast majority of probiotics on the shelf in the market at the stores are gonna die in the gastric system, right? They're not even designed to be, by nature, designed to be alive in the gut. And so they don't actually fit the definition of a probiotic. Now you go to the spore, the spore is even more different because not only does the spore survive, but it does so because it has this capability of wrapping itself in a armored like uh, calcified armored like protein coating. And it does that anytime it's outside of the body. So if it leaves the body through defecation, it's no longer in its natural habitat, which is the gut. So it covers itself in this, in this armor like coating. So it can exist in the outside environment indefinitely until swallowed again. And that armor like coating allows it to uh, survive through the harsh gastric system. And the moment it hits the small intestine, it comes out of this armor-like coating and goes to work for you as a probiotic, right? So this is a really important component of the spore. Now, that doesn't mean all spores act as probiotics either, because there's lots of spores that are, you know, adapted to living in this creature or that creature or this environment or that environment. What you really need is a spore that's been designed by nature to live in the human gut and understand the human microbiome, because it has to when it gets in there, identify the, the dysfunctional bacteria, sit next to them, have the tools to reduce the growth of those microbes, and then have the same to uh, have different tools to increase the growth of the beneficial bacteria. So we were very, very careful in selecting the right spores and megaspore. And it took decades of work with uh, Simon Cutting and the folks, the researchers at University of London. Uh, Royal Holloway to identify the right spores that had these capabilities, right? So the, just keep in mind that the vast majority of probiotic products and, and strains out in the shelf, 
that you can get just walking into the health food store have never been tested in the human system, right? Certainly not the finished formula that they're putting out there. And we know that many of those formulas will contain microbes that either A, are not properly characterized, meaning it's a different microbe in the product than the what they're claiming on the label, and B, they have no idea what happens when you combine all these microbes together, right? Because companies just go, more is better. So we're going to put 15 strains at 100 billion CFUs as if just throwing a bunch of stuff together is the best approach. We know now from a couple of studies from the uh, from Israeli Institute and so on that some of these what I call kitchen sick formulas actually do more harm than good. We've actually done a bunch of studies where we see that the majority of probiotic strains that we test are actually very inflammatory. They turn on inflammation in the body more than anything else, right? So we have to be careful with probiotics. We want to make sure it's strains that have been studied in humans to know what happens clinically, to know what happens to the microbiome. And if it's a formula of more than one strain, that the combination has been studied, right? So hopefully that 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 helps to make sense. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the spores start to fix the dysbiosis. They bring down the dysfunctional bacteria and they dramatically increase the beneficial bacteria. Then the next step is to feed the right prebiotics. So this new microbiome that you're developing, which has this really high levels of keystone species that are beneficial, those microbes get fed adequately so that they can start to establish themselves. And this becomes more of your dominant microbiome, right? And it doesn't keep fluctuating between the pathogens winning out sometimes, and then the beneficial bacteria fight back and they go back and forth, right? This is what happens when you take, for example, loads of antimicrobials or an antibiotic to try to fix your gut, right? What, what is happening is you may knock down the, the pathogens for a short period of time, but then they just come rearing back up, right? So just look at the number of SIBO patients that have gone through two, three, four rounds of rifaximin with no, with no good results to show for it, right? Because you can't fix the microbiome like that. You can't take all these microbes knock everything down and hope that what comes back is good, right? More than likely what comes back is going to look similar to what was there before. And so, so what we want is a true ecological change to the microbiome where the good functional bacteria win out over time and take over the real estate, right? And that's what the combination of the probiotic and the prebiotic does. Now, the last step in this is called mega mucosa. The reason it's called that is because there are some critical components that are designed to rebuild that mucosa lining. Mm -hmm. Remember that mucosa lining in the small intestine is thin uh, because it makes it easier to absorb things. But in the large intestine, where the, where the largest variation of microbes exist, the mucosa layer is very thick and there's two distinct structures to it. And if you do, don't have a thick mucosa layer, you have a significant risk of chronic disease, right? This is called mucosal dysfunction. If you look up mucosal dysfunction, you see that virtually every chronic disease is tied to that, including very scary things like Crohn's, colitis, microcolitis, colorectal cancer, and so on. Those are all associated with a diminished mucosal layer, right? So rebuilding the mucosal layer becomes really important. So what's in there to in order to rebuild the mucosal layer? Well, the mucosa layer is made up of four amino acids that are bound to sugars that becomes the structure of the mucosa. If you don't have adequate intake of those four amino acids in your diet, you can't rebuild the mucosa, mm -hmm. even if you have beneficial bacteria to do it. So we wanted to make sure that we put those four key amino acids in the product. And then we added polyphenols. Now, the reason we added polyphenols is number one, polyphenols reduce inflammation in the mucosa which in order to repair anything on your body, you have to reduce the inflammation, right? If the, if the system is inflamed, it cannot repair, right? The analogy I give is like, if you give, get a cut on your hand, if you just leave it, it's going to heal itself, right? But imagine every morning you woke up and twice a day, you rubbed it really hard, you scratched at it, right? Adding <clears throat> irritation and inflammation to it, that'll negate the repair. The same thing happens in your gut. Right. If your gut is continuously inflamed and irritated, it will negate the repair. So you want to get some polyphenols and antioxidants in there to reduce some of that inflammation. And then the polyphenols also feed a very important bacteria called acromantia. And acromantia plays an important role of rebuilding that mucosal structure 
by inducing the gene expression that's needed for that. On top of that, we also have immunoglobulins. Immunoglobulins bind up all these toxins that are in your system, your LPS and mold toxins and all that, reducing the toxigenic load in that mucosal structure so that it can rebuild itself, right? So we've gone through painstaking detail looking at that pathology of how leaky gut starts and what happens in sequence. And then this system is designed to reverse that sequence, right? So the immunoglobulins, I hope I'm saying that right, that's the mega IgG 2000, mm -hmm. correct? And that is something that I take daily. I kind of think about it as the little Pac-Man that kind of cleans up the stuff that's mm -hmm. not supposed to be there. Um, so I can't believe how much time. We only have like a, a nine minutes left and we... I really want to get to the Zen Biome because this is a new supplement and my whole family's on it. Um, by the way, everybody, everything we're talking about, I take on a daily basis, every single one, because my gut is my life, right? I, it literally is everything that you are, um, your energy, your physical, mental, mental energy. And so the mental part I want to get to, um, the gut brain access, if you can touch on that and the importance of it and how it goes both ways, which is really interesting and where the Zen biome comes in. And I love the fact that you touch on people with gut issues have now become so psychologically warped that they're, they think of themselves as gut people, right? Mm -hmm. I've got to worry about going to a restaurant. I've got to be, so they've got this psychosis that's happening mm -hmm separate from the gut where the Zen biome is actually addressing that connection yeah. and that communication. So a lot to cover in the next eight minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, we can, we can get it done for sure. Okay. Um, so, so a quick one-on-one on the gut brain connection. So think about number one, it's important to think about that the gut and the brain are not two separate systems. They're actually two parts of the same system in the, from the embryonic stage they evolve from the same polar region of the embryo, they evolve into the same types of tissue. The blood brain barrier and the gut barrier are very, very similar. And there's all of these important uh, bi-directional highway connections between the gut and the brain. So the enteric nervous system, which is the neurological system that covers your digestive tract, is, has a second highest nerve ending density in the body next to the brain. It has more nerve endings than your spinal cord does. Right. And the microbes in your gut have full access to this enteric nervous system. So that's often called your other brain or your second brain. Now, one of the ways it's connected is through the vagus nerve. So your enteric nervous system is connected directly to the brain through the vagus nerve. Um, and, and it's a bi-directional highway. So the brain can send things down the vagus nerve to the enteric nervous system that impacts the microbes and your gut function. And then the microbes can send stuff up directly to your brain as well. And then beyond the vagus nerve, your, your gut and the brain are connected through your circulation, through your lymphatic system, through your immune system, and so on. Um, but let's break down the most important parts of this, right? This is really significant and important because we know that the prevalence rate for anxiety, depression, and mood disorders is way, way high, right? It's some of the most prevailing conditions that people are dealing with in the U.S., it's estimated that up to 60% of adults have some form of anxiety every single day, right? If you look at anxiety and depression, that's actually over 100 million people in the U.S. And that's looking just at adults. As you mentioned earlier, Sarah, every kid mm -hmm. is having this kind of uh, cognitive issue, right? In, in young, young kids, it, it displays as mood uh, and behavior disorders, right? tantrums and things like that. And then in, as kids get older, it starts to manifest more like classical anxiety or classical depression uh, or spectrum disorders or ADD. These are all part of the same types of dysfunction. And so what's what's happening here is that there, there are really two main mechanisms to think about. One is leaky gut is present in all of these. The country of Netherlands did a big nine-year study called the Netherlands Study on Anxiety and Depression. They were trying to figure out why do we have such a high prevalence of anxiety and depression? What are the biomarkers that we can use to, to test for this, measure for this? What are the risk factors? They found one thing, one thing that was predictive almost 99% of the time 
for the presence of anxiety and depression, and that's endotoxins from a leaky gut present in circulation, right? The main endotoxin they're talking about is LPS, lipopolysaccharide. Now, this is called an endotoxin because it's not a toxin that comes in from the outside. This is a toxin that's generated in your gut by about half the bacteria that exists in your gut, right? And the microbes are constantly making this. If your gut is leaky, it's allowed to leak through into circulation. So in this nine-year large-scale study, they showed that if you had elevated levels of endotoxin LPS, or leaky gut, if you will, that you had a very high propensity for anxiety and depression, and then down the road for, anxiety, for uh, dementia and Alzheimer's as well. Now, why is that? Well, this LPS, right? One of the things it does is it interferes with dopamine and serotonin binding in the brain. When LPS leaks through and ends up in circulation, it can make its way throughout the body, including all over the brain, right? And so when it gets into the brain, it, it embeds itself in dopamine and serotonin receptors. So now your brain can't utilize dopamine and serotonin the right way. So you don't have the happy hormone, you don't have the reward centers, and you can't sleep properly. Right. So now you're much more susceptible to stress induction. Now, the other problem that occurs is when you induce stress, cortisol goes up. Cortisol is a big thing of driving you into the flight or fight response. Right. Now, what happens to cortisol? It also gets dumped into the gut. In part, it gets metabolized in the gut. And part of that metabolic process is to stop the flight or fight response. That becomes the off switch eventually. But if you don't have the right microbes in the gut, and most people who have leaky gut don't have the right microbes, if you don't have the right microbe in the gut, when cortisol enters the gut through your stress cycle, it creates profound leakiness in the gut, even more than you had before. And that shoots up a uh, inflammatory cytokine called IL-6. IL-6 can make its way to the brain and re-trigger your HPA axis and stress response again. Right. So so imagine this is what's happening with the vast majority of people, including kids. Their guts are leaky. So they constantly have LPS leaking through. LPS has made its way to the brain and it's embedded itself into the dopamine and serotonin receptors. So even though you're making enough dopamine and serotonin, you can't use it effectively. So you're now you're already saddened. It's hard for you to, to trigger the reward centers of your brain to feel excited about things. You're at a heightened state of sensitivity, right? So you're much more susceptible to stressors. And then on top of that, an external stressor comes in. And it doesn't have to be much. It could be a text message that you get, right? It could be someone cuts you off on the highway. That fires your flight or fight response. Now your HPA axis is active. Because of that HPA axis and flight or fight response, cortisol levels go up. Some of that cortisol dumps into the gut. Your gut becomes profoundly leaky. IL-6 goes up. IL-6 goes back to the brain, re-triggers the same HPA axis. So a single stressor in that state that you expose in the morning, for example, will continue to re-trigger your stress response throughout the day. It's as if that same stressor is following you and triggering a response every single hour, every single day, right? So not only can you not utilize dopamine and serotonin to calm yourself down, you've got your sympathetic HPA activation constantly putting you in flight, fight or fight, right? So you're constantly in this flight or fight state. You can't utilize uh, the important hormones and neurotransmitters to calm down. And that's why such a huge percentage of people remain in this chronic stress state. Now, psychobiotics attenuate all that. This is where Zen biome comes in. These are microbes in the gut that it can attenuate neurological function in the brain. And these psychobiotics stop that reactivation of the HPA axis. They stop the interference of LPS with dopamine and serotonin uh, receptors and allow your dopamine and serotonin to work properly. And they shift your brain waves. So you go from high frequency, high anxiety brain waves to low frequency, much more calm brain waves. And they shift you back to the parasympathetic rest and digest symptom. So those are microbes in the gut that are that are psychobiotics that can do that for you. And if you're missing those, you miss all of those functionalities. 
Amazing. I can't believe you finished in eight minutes. And uh -huh. there's so much more that we didn't even get into. And I know I had questions about protocols and how to take the supplements. So we have to have you back. We got to do it um, too. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. So, um, and everyone, this is why you have to join my free group coaching because I will definitely be following up this podcast with those protocols and the links to the products. You can find them all at sarabantahealth.com um, and more. And you know me, I'm all about the gut. So please help me share this episode, share this information with your friends and family. As Karan mentioned, statistically, we all need this. We're all suffering. Even if you don't have bloat and constipation, you probably have leaky gut. Um, so definitely join the free group coaching with the link below on Telegram. And you can use coupon WELCOME10 for 10% off site wide. That's all on the Mega Spore, Mega Pre, Mega Mucosa, the Mega IgG2000, um, and now the Zen Biome. I am taking all of these uh, myself, and so is everyone in my family. I walk the walk and I feel a difference. So there you go. Thanks everybody for joining us here and have a great week. Mm -hmm.